Hey guys, Dr. Ash here with a quick video on normal physical assessment. Okay, so a lot of students get pretty overwhelmed when it comes to a physical assessment, but at the end of the day, I'm here to make it just a little bit easier on you and let you know that physical assessment really is not too bad. So let's talk about a couple of things or normal, if you will, for physical assessment. So let's get started here. So our techniques that are very common when it comes to assessment are inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, um, and that is typically the order in which we do a physical assessment or an area of a focused assessment that you want to do it on. Um, however, one exception does exist, and that happens to be the abdominal assessment. And so for the abdominal assessment, we typically want to go in order of inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation. And the reason for that is uh, percussion and palpation will tend to alter bowel sounds. And so we really want to be able to listen to bowel sounds uninterrupted, if that makes sense. Okay. So we don't want to put any sort of other factor into when we listen to our bowel sounds. So Again, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation, normally when we're focused on an area, but for the abdomen specifically, we're talking about inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation. So let's talk about each of these techniques very briefly. Inspection. It is always number one, guys. You will come to a point when you're a nurse several years from now, and I don't know when it'll be, but you'll be like, hmm, Dr. Ash was right. You tend to use inspection when you first walk into a room. You inspect to see what's going on. At some point in your career, you're going to learn to do that without even thinking about it on your patient. Um, and pretty soon, if you follow down my pathway, at least, you'll end up being in the grocery store when you do this on patients as well. But this tends to be sight and smell for patient observations. One of the things you need is good lighting. You need good body mechanics and posture. You need to provide privacy. And it also may require an otoscope or ophthalmoscope if you want to get really fancy. Moving on to palpation, this uses the sense of touch. And we tend to do tender or painful areas areas last again because we do not want to disrupt or cause harm or discomfort to your patient you want to be able to get a good assessment before you start creating discomfort or pain in your patient if you will light palpation tends to assess texture temperature and moisture of skin whereas deep palpation is used more for organ location What's the size of an internal organ, the symmetry, et cetera, tends to be a little more advanced than our physical assessment. So we won't go into deep palpation too much. Other things that palpation can do for us can determine if there's swelling in an area, if you notice vibration in an area, pulsation, if something's rigid or spastic, if you hear crepitus, which is some air trapping lumps, masses, tenderness, and pain. So just palpation is a good general assessment of everything um, in regards or can be used in every section in regards to physical assessment. Percussion. This is a tapping of the skin. And I'm not going to go too deep into percussion because again, percussion is one of those things that tends to be an advanced assessment. And we are here for basic assessment. For the most part, the majority of bedside nurses are not doing percussion, okay? But if you wanted to, it assesses the underlying structure based on vibrations and sounds. It tells if there's air in an area, fluid in the area, or if it's something more solid like a mass. Uh, the sound of resonance is very deep and full, whereas hyper resonance is a very much a thud sound. It's very dense, okay? Oftentimes we use resonance when we're talking about lung sounds, percussing of the lung sounds. And then of course, if I were to percuss over my stomach when it's empty, it would be very hollow and drum-like. So just understand that percussion is there, but again, I don't think you're gonna see anything, especially if you are a nursing student that's kind of in your first or second semester, percussion's really not one of those things that we go crazy about. All right, the next one is auscultation, which uses the sense of hearing. So we use a stethoscope to be able to listen to certain sounds within the body, which happen to be heart sounds, lung sounds, and bowel sounds. We can go a little deeper than that on some other areas, um, but let's just stay at surface level. I think the only other choice here would be auscultation of a brewery, which is spelled B-R-U-I-T. A brewery is actually a whooshing sound that happens up in the carotid arteries. When 
when there's some sort of blockage or turbulence or something happening to that blood flow because the blood has to push a little bit harder and faster to get over that turbulence or blockage or whatever the case may be. So just understand that for the most part, auscultation is heart, lung, and bowel sounds, except when you're listening for a brulee in the carotid um, arteries. So let's talk about a couple of big body systems that tend to show up, especially in your first level of nursing school, integumentary or the skin. And so we do this by inspection and palpation of the hair, skin, and nails, anything on the surface, really. A couple of things we're looking for is color. Normal color, guys, is pink or a natural type of color. That's how it's described. We do have two major alterations that I want you to be aware of. One is cyanosis or a blue discoloration determines that there's lack of oxygen in the bloodstream or low oxygen. And that's usually found either around the lips, the gums, or the nail beds. Okay, so those are going to be your primary locations for cyanosis. Jaundice is a yellowing of the skin, which could be an indication of a high bilirubin level. And tend to what we tend to look at is the sclera or the white of the eye that turns yellow. And then, of course, the skin as well. Other things that we're going to assess on the integumentary would be temperature. Is it warm, cool, hot to the touch? Is it moist? Is it dry? Skin turgor, we're going to assess for hydration. And we typically do that by pinching or tinting the skin on the back of the forearm, the forehead, or the sternum. And then, of course, any kind of like basic alterations in the skin would be bruising, itching, rash, swelling, lesions, skin breakdown of any sort. But again, outside of the scope of this particular video. Moving on to the dark complexion. So we do have some patients that are a little bit darker natured than the rest of us. And so it can be a little tricky finding these typical assessment findings. And so for a cyanotic or a blue or a low oxygen patient in our darker complexion uh, clients, we see that the long, uh, the lips or the tongue are gray, the long, I was trying to do two words at once. Lips and tongue are gray. The conjunctiva or conjunctiva, whatever you want to call it, which is the lower eyelids tend to be pale and nail beds, the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet will actually turn a bluish discoloration. Jaundice is most likely to be found in the oral mucosa and the sclera. Bleeding tends to either be swelling or darkening of a specific area. And then if there's an inflammation or swelling in a darker complexion patient, they tend, the skin tends to be shiny or taut, which means it's pulled very tightly, or it could be like a pitting situation where I put my finger into it and it just dips down or pits, if you will. Moving on to the eyes, we typically use inspection, palpation, and vision testing. Here's where I'm going to tell you anything that you have two of, two eyebrows, two eyelashes, two eyes, two ears, um, two breasts, two arms, two legs. We tend to compare for symmetry and whether or not something is even. So I'm looking to make sure the eyebrows are the same, the eyelashes are the same, and the eyes are the same. The conjunctiva should be clear, pink, moist. The sclera should be white. Pupils, we tend to hear the comment PERLA or the acronym PERLA, which just means pupils are equal, round, re round, reactive to light and accommodation. So when we illuminate them or we shine a light into the eyes, the pupil should constrict or react. Vision testing, probably the most common and basic that we're going to talk about here is the Snellen chart. The Snellen chart is very good for distance vision at about 20 feet. So we base everything on the norm of 20 feet. That's where the term 2020 comes from. Moving on to ears, nose, and throat, we would use inspection and palpation. Specifically, when we talk about the ears, we would inspect and palpate for shape, size, and symmetry. The nose, we want to assess for any discharge, bleeding, swelling, tenderness, etc. Mouth and throat, again, we're going to assess for presence of lesions, bleeding, and any other concerns that they might have. Moving on to our lungs, we're obviously going to use all of the above. Um, again, percussion is one of those things that tends to be an advanced concept, so we won't really go there. But inspection, palpation, and auscultation 100% absolutely can be and or are. And so we inspect the chest condition. What does the skin look like? Is there any swelling? Is there anything that's abnormal just from looking at the skin or the chest? 
we look at color, we look at respiratory rate, and we want to make sure that the chest has equal movements. So we see that both sides of the chest rise and fall in unison, and it doesn't have kind of a seesaw or awkward looking shape. Palpation, temperature, moisture. We also do excursion and tactile or vocal fremitus. Excursion, very basically put, we encircle um, we take our hands and we encircle the patient's chest. We have them inhale. And basically what we're doing is we're watching to make sure that our thumbs separate when they inhale and come back together when they exhale. Okay, so we would use palpation for that. And then the last one is fremitus, which basically means we put our hands or our fingertips in certain parts of the lung fields and we ask them to say a word like 99 and we should be able to hear equal or feel, sorry, we're on feel, we should be able to feel equal vibration on both sides. Lastly, again, I told you percussion. We're just going to kind of skip over because that's more of an advanced concept. But we talk about auscultation or listening. We have anterior, which is front, lateral, which is side, and then posterior lung sounds. And really the big thing that we want you to be able to identify here are the types of adventitious or abnormal lung sounds. And so our top three that we're going to be most interested in, if any, will be crackles, which tend to be bubbling sounds, wheezing, which are often described as high-pitched and musical, and then ronchi or ronchorus tend to be coarse breath sounds that will actually clear up if you have your patient to take a deep breath and cough. Moving on to the heart, we typically use inspection, palpation, percussion, and again, auscultation. Again, percussion, not something we're going to go there with. But for inspection, again, we would look at the anterior chest. You can typically actually see pulsation of the heart if you have a patient who is um, thin enough. So the larger body habitus, it's going to be hard to see this. But on infants, children, and smaller framed adults, you tend to be able to see kind of the uh, fluttering. I hate to say fluttering. The the beating of the heart is what I'm trying to say. Don't know why that was so hard, but anyways. And then palpation, we typically use the PMI, which is the point of maximal intensity. And that's on the left side, fourth to fifth intercostal space and about the mid clavicular line. But PMI usually works pretty good as well. And then of course, auscultation, we would listen for the apical pulse. We tend to assess an apical pulse for a full minute. It tends to be if there's any sort of irregularity in a peripheral pulse, like when we're assessing the pulses of our patients, if those are irregular or we're concerned about those at all, then we would go to the chest and listen for an apical pulse. And then of course, the apical pulse is also very good to... Um, listen to murmurs. Okay. Listen to murmurs. You should be hearing an S1 and S2 or what's known as a lub dub sound. Lub dub, lub dub. Moving on to the abdomen. In addition to changing the pattern of which we assess the abdomen, the other thing you want to do too is make sure that your patient has emptied their bladder because a full bladder can actually cause an alteration in the abdominal assessment as well. Fun fact. So we make sure we uh, touch or palpate the painful area last. We inspect, again, the surface symmetry. Is the belly round? Is the abdomen flat? So we're going to look at contour. Auscultation, we want to make sure that we hold the stethoscope on the diaphragm side close to the body very lightly to the body. We assess all four quadrants. We should hear some tinkling, rumbling, digestive kinds of sounds. I always think it's kind of cool to tell students to listen to their own bowel sounds. Listen to it before you eat, after you eat, and completely empty stomach first thing in the morning. It sounds different all times of the day. Um, and if you think your patient has absent bowel sounds, by all means, y'all listen for a full five minutes because we really want to confirm that those bowel sounds are truly absent because that is an abnormal finding. Percussion, again, we're moving on. Palpation, we do light palpation before deep. And of course, if anything's painful or any particular side is painful, we want to make sure we hold off on that. Just a couple of other areas that I want to talk about real fast. We have musculoskeletal. Again, we have two arms and two legs. So we tend to assess both sides. We make sure that the sides are equal in strength, equal in their ability to move things. Breast, are they equal on both sides? Bowel and bladder, 
How's your bowel and bladder habits? If they're abnormal, then you would go into a further assessment. But again, remember, we're talking about very surface level, basic assessment techniques. Of course, neurological, alert, and oriented times four, person, place, time, and situation. Several questions that you can ask about that. But that's a general rule when we're talking about assessment findings. I think the only other thing that I want to add here is when we talk about pulse intensity, so we, we compare the sides, right, because we have two radial pulses, so we would compare both sides to make sure they're equal and they're in, their strength is the same, because that can actually tell you if there's something going on with one side of the heart or the other, but again, kind of some advanced concepts there. So we'll stop there. And I hope you guys find it helpful. So make sure you like, comment, and or share whichever one applies to you. And I will see you guys next time.